In this lesson, I will teach you some of the techniques that are required to become adept with the brushes in Rebel. Some of these techniques involve gestures, while others utilize the behavior of the brush shape and media. I'll continue using a light gray canvas set to white simple. The simplest technique is dabbing the brush. I'll choose Clumpy Dab in the Nature category and scale it larger. Then I'll press my pen firmly against the tablet. Some brushes will instantly make a dab, but others may require you to hold the pen down for a while, and maybe even wiggle the pen slightly to build up the opacity. In this case, my dab is created by the shape and grain. Depending on the properties of the brush, you may be able to control the shape, grain, size, and opacity of the dab using pressure or other expressions. You can use dabs side by side to create a pattern, or you can overlap them to create a more intricate dab. You can combine dabs like this to create trees and other types of fractal-shaped objects. Clicking with your mouse is the easiest way to create a single dab at a time. This can be useful to prevent your brush medium from building up too rapidly. A step up from dabbing is making a stroke. The stroke-based techniques will require a drawing tablet. When you press your pen to the tablet and then move it, the brush dab repeats, creating a stroke. There are numerous ways you can create that stroke depending on the direction, length, pressure, velocity, and other expressions that you use. Overlapping strokes can also change the look of the marks that you get. This brush uses grain and paper if I choose to use it, so I have control over the pattern I get within the strokes. Let's look at some of the techniques you can use with strokes. We've spent considerable time creating strokes with pen pressure, but let's go more in depth into the anatomy of a stroke. I'll select the smooth pen brush and then create a stroke that goes from heavy to light pressure. How quickly you draw your strokes can affect their appearance as well as your ability to control the stroke. If you create a stroke with a slow velocity, chances are the stroke width is not going to transition smoothly from thick to thin. But if you draw your stroke quickly, with some practice, you should be able to taper the ends of the strokes. A tapered stroke is essential for creating hair, grass, branches, and many other objects. It's also useful for fading opacity in a stroke and for creating ink outlines. In addition to varying the brush size and opacity with pressure, you can also vary blending, grain, and other useful properties. Next, let's try some techniques for working with opacity. I'll select the soft airbrush and use a large brush. If I paint firmly and then gradually decrease pressure, I'm able to build up the opacity and then fade it out to create a gradient. You could think of this as a long overlapping stroke that slowly tapers off. I can also select another color and blend these two colors together by using opacity linked to pressure. We've covered the opacity properties in previous lessons, so we'll move on. I'll open the glazing face template and I'll choose the glazing soft brush. Brushes that can glaze work well for building up opacity using pressure. You can very easily use pressure to get different values rather than changing your color. For example, I can select the fill layer and enable lock transparency. Now I can select either black or white to add form to the face using pen pressure to control the opacity. Brushes that are using the glaze mode can build up light glazes more easily because they don't build up upon themselves unless you lift your pen up. This is just rough shading for demonstration's sake, but it shows you how you can create a lot of detail just by utilizing pen pressure to get a variety of color values. As you can see, I can create my artwork in grayscale and then add color later using glazing techniques. Next, I will open the glow template and we'll take a look at another opacity building technique using a glow brush. I'll use my custom glow brush, but this technique applies to just about any brush that can glow. I'll choose a darker color that matches the hue of one of my stars, and if I paint on a layer that is set to screen, I can create a glowing halo around the star. I can use pen pressure to modulate the opacity, and I can lift my pen up to build up the glow. If I make my brush smaller, that can help the light look more concentrated in the center. And then to feather out the glow, I can use a larger brush. Working back and forth between large and small will give you the best results. If the glow is building up too slowly for you, choose a brighter color. Another way to use glow is with a fine brush to create rim highlights on an object. I'll load the pencil template, and let's take a look at another technique that utilizes pressure to control opacity. 
I'll choose the sketching pencil and a dark gray color. If I sketch with this brush, I can vary the opacity of my pencil marks using pressure. This brush also reacts to pen tilt, so I can tilt my pen to simulate shading with the side of a pencil. This elongates the dab and further reduces the opacity, so now I can more easily build up gradients like I could with the airbrush. Overlapping several strokes will build up the pencil darker. Choosing a lighter or darker gray and adjusting the canvas texture influence can help simulate various degrees of pencil hardness. You can also add color to the pencils and blend them together. Next, I'll share some techniques for freehand drawing curves and lines. I'll select the smooth pen brush. I want to mention that I am working on a fairly large 27 inch display tablet. If you're working on a tablet that is very small, it's going to be more difficult to make these gestures because you need a lot of room to move your arm. Let's start with a straight line. I'm going to try to keep my wrist and elbow locked, and I will draw using my elbow as the axis of motion. I'm not drawing using my wrist, I'm not drawing using my fingers, it's all in the elbow. Don't focus on what you're doing with your pen, just concentrate on getting the gesture right. Once you get the arm movement down, begin to work on the velocity of your stroke. You want to make a fluid, fast stroke so that the line doesn't have time to wobble. Once you get the hang of it, you should be able to draw fairly straight lines. For curves, the arm movement is the same. You want to draw from your elbow. A medium velocity works best to get a smooth curve. With some practice, you may even be able to freehand draw ellipses. Another way to draw curves is to plant the ball of your wrist on the tablet surface and use it to constrain the movement of your line. As you can see, the pen is on the tablet, but my motion is constrained around the axis of my hand. You can also segment your lines if that works better for you. In fact, sometimes it looks better stylistically if your line isn't completely solid. Rotating your canvas can also help you draw at a more comfortable angle. Let's move on to explore some of the techniques I use when working with textured brushes, such as the chalk and sponge. I'll load the primitive shapes template and choose my custom chalk brush. I'll start out painting over the front side of the cube. I'll enable lock transparency and I will paint with very light pressure so that the texture builds up slowly. If I want the texture to be stronger in some areas, I can use firmer pressure and overlap strokes to build it up. You can also layer up multiple textures. I'll select Cracked, scale it larger, and increase the contrast. If I put some of that on top, it helps the texture look less repetitive. I can use the same techniques with my sponge brush on the top of the cube. I'll use light pressure to lightly add texture, or heavier pressure to make the texture stronger. Now let's take a look at some blending techniques. We've already explored how many of the blenders work in the previous lesson but let's cover some additional ways to use them. I'll load the distance template and I'll select my blur blender. I'll blend the background layer to set it back into the distance. This creates a sense of focal depth. If your blend is too strong, you may want to lower the opacity of the brush. I'll reset the brush to its original settings. Another way to use blenders is to pull the pixels to create bristly looking effects like hair or grass. I'll select the streaky blender and pull upward on the edge of the grass layer to make dozens of individual grass blades in a single stroke. One thing to be aware of is how blenders affect the edges of paint on a layer. I'll load the blenders template. For example, diffuse blur will pull in paint unexpectedly onto the blank part of the canvas. If I blend in the middle of the layer, everything is fine. But as soon as I blend near the edges, paint appears in the center of the cursor, which ruins the edge. This doesn't happen with the grainy blender. Instead, I can blend near the edge and nothing happens. I'll blend the edge of the paint out to transparency to show you what I'm trying to accomplish. The difference is that diffuse blur is based on a blender tool, as you can see in the properties. And grainy blender is an oil slash acrylics brush that is using the blend mode. For whatever reason, the blend tool behaves this way, so I wouldn't recommend using blend tool brushes for edge blending. If possible, try to create custom blenders by toggling other brush types to the blend mode. Or if you like the effect of a blender tool brush, just avoid the edges while using it. Or start the stroke inside the layer like I am doing with the streaky blender. Another consideration is that if lock transparency is enabled, 
You can't pull paint out to the blank areas of the canvas, but you can pull transparency into the paint if you start your stroke outside the layer. Let's move on to try another technique. Tinting can be useful when you want to gradually create a color by layering transparent media. This is somewhat similar to the glazing technique we looked at earlier, but tinting will work with just about any brush in Rebel. To demonstrate, I'll open the Primitive Shapes template. I want to tint the sphere to color it blue, but I don't want to accidentally paint outside of the shape, so I could turn on Lock Transparency and paint over the shape with a soft airbrush. But the paint is opaque and it covers the shading. If I want to paint inside of the sphere and have the color blend with the shading rather than replace it, what I need to do is create a new layer above the sphere, set the layer blending mode to multiply or linear burn, then right click on the new layer and choose clipping mask. I'll explain exactly what this does later, but if I paint over the sphere, you can see that it's essentially keeping the paint trapped within the boundaries of the layer the clipping mask has been applied to. As you can see, I have tinted the sphere, which colorizes it, while maintaining the shading values beneath. One of the advantages to creating colors this way is that the tinting layer is separate from the shading. This gives you the flexibility to reduce the opacity of your tinting layers to make them more subtle. And you can even change the tinting to a different color using a filter, or by turning on lock transparency and painting over it with something else. 